my name is Joanna, I'm one of the midwives that works here at South Tyneside Birthing Centre and also go between here and Sunderland Hospital. Today is our second class of our antenatal classes. This is going to be the labour and delivery class. It is the longest class out of them all, so make sure you've got a glass of water or a cuppa and a little pen and paper to make some notes and we're just going to go through labour and delivery. If you have any questions about this presentation, don't hesitate once it's over to contact either us at the birthing centre or your local hospital that you are booked at to have your baby. And thank you for watching in advance. So this class is going to cover recognising the onset of labour. A lot of people aren't sure how to recognise they're going into labour. We're going to discuss coping mechanisms in the latent phase, what a show is, contractions. We're going to do the breakdown of the different stages of labour. We're going to talk about pain relief, types of delivery, monitoring the baby and induction of labour. So as you can see, that is quite a lot to cover. Um, there are several signs that labour might be starting. The first signs that most people tend to experience are contractions or tightening like pains. Some people experience a show, other people it starts with backache. Some people might find that they need to go to the toilet more often to open the bowels, which can be cause of the baby's head pressing down. One of the signs of the latent phase of labour might be your water's breaking. Your water's breaking or your membranes might rupture when you're in labour, throughout your labour or the midwife might have to break them for you at some point. If your membranes rupture in the latent phase of labour and you're at home, pop a pad on, keep an eye of the colour and make sure you ring the maternity unit that you're booked at as we might want to assess if these waters have gone and the colour of these waters. Once your membranes have broken, we do normally like the baby to be born within 24 hours as the protective bubble around the baby has gone and there's a slight more chance of infection. So like I say, just don't hesitate to contact the maternity unit at any point if you think that your waters have broken. But remember, all of these things are different for different people and can take time. So we're going to go through them in a little bit more detail. So the latent phase of labour. The latent phase of labour is when your cervix has to soften and thin out and become shorter and flatter so that it then starts to dilate. This can take several hours and for some women it can actually take days. This sometimes people might know as early labour or the beginning of labour but we always call it the latent phase. During this phase you're often advised to stay at home as the longer you can stay at home in the latent phase, it's been proven that you have oxytocin and happy hormones and you're more comfortable in your own environment and that causes your labour to shorten and causes them changes in your cervix to happen quicker. This slide here shows what I'm talking about. So this is what's happening in the latent phase of labour. This is cervical effacement. So you can see that your cervix starts off and it looks about two centimetres to three centimetres long. It's about two centimetres wide. It's thick and it's closed. Throughout this latent phase of labour and sometimes throughout labour as well, the cervix will soften, it'll shorten and it'll begin to dilate. And it's at that when it starts dilating that that's when labour begins properly. The latent phase of labour will often say, like I've said, to stay at home as long as you possibly can. So when you're at home and when these latent phases begin, in, you might often feel crampy, backache, it often feels like period pains. So we often say, cope with this at home the best you can like what you would do for your own period pains so if you like a heat pack if you like a hot water bottle you can take regular paracetamol every four hours that's absolutely fine we say to drink plenty of fluids and avoid dehydration because when you're dehydrated that can actually slow the labor process down warm baths a massage 
and we would obviously say anything that helps you feel calm and comfortable. If you like music, if you like candles in your own home, if you like aromatherapy oils, as long as they're safe in pregnancy, whatever makes you feel calm, comfortable and relaxed, that's what we want you to do. In the latent phase of labour, you need to be as calm and comfortable as possible. It's often that animals, when they're feeling that they're going into labour, they go into a calm, a quiet, a warm, dark place, and it's to go with the natural instincts of your body, so to do similar things often helps. So, as we've already discussed, in this latent phase of labour, you might start to get contractions or tightenings that feel like period cramps. They're often not in a regular pattern, which I will discuss next, but at this part, some people might experience a show. You might experience a show in your third trimester of pregnancy, but often it can be throughout the latent phase of labour or in labour itself. On the slide shown, there is a picture of a show. What a show is, it's also what we call your mucus plug or your membrane plug. You might have heard of these terms. It's a mucusy substance that sits inside the cervix and as the cervix opens and softens, this mucusy substance will come out through the vagina. As shown on the pictures, a mucusy show can be clear and looks like a clear jelly-like substance. It can have a slight pink tinge to it. And in some cases, it can also have a ready bloodstained tinge, which the bottom photo does show. We get lots of women ringing up and often saying, I've passed a jelly-like substance and it's like mucusy and it's a bit bloody. And they're often a bit confused at what it is and often concerned. A mucus show is completely normal and often, like I say, a sign that things are happening and a sign that labour might be coming on. If you are passing fresh red blood or if there is a bloody tinge to your show, make sure you ring the maternity unit that you booked at or if you just want to ring the maternity unit whenever you've passed a show for a bit of advice or guidance, that's absolutely fine. A show might come away as one sort of big piece or it can come off every time you're wiping or it can come out steadily throughout labour. All of this is completely normal. It's also normal some women do not have a show. So don't worry if after you've watched this you're waiting for that sign of a show because sometimes you might not have one as well. So here's a little picture of where the mucus plug or the show actually sits. So you can see that it's in the cervix, which is obviously placed in front of the baby's head. And that is the opening to the womb that the baby then passes through. So as the cervix softens and shortens and begins to dilate, the mucus plug is then passed through that cervix. Contractions. So Contractions is one of the most important things to talk about and I think one of the questions we get most as midwives is how will I know that I'm having contractions or what do contractions feel like or what are contractions? Contractions is your womb tightening, your abdomen muscles, your stomach muscles tightening and relaxing. Contractions for most people, especially as the start, feel like period pains. At first, you might experience Braxton Hicks contractions or tightenings. This is when your uterine muscle contracts and releases and contracts and releases. And it might do this a few times in 10 minutes, a few times every hour or a few times a day. And that is as labour builds up or towards the end of your pregnancy. And these are called Braxton Hicks contractions or tightenings. Now they're just short, little crampy like pains and that's sort of your body practicing contractions that's your body getting used to producing contractions as labor gets going or as the latent phase starts phasing in to the active late phase of labor your contractions will become stronger they'll become longer and they'll become more regular we'll have a slide next that discusses the length and strength of your contractions the aim of contractions is to contract your womb, to tighten all your stomach muscles and to push your baby down. And that pushing your baby down causes pressure on your cervix and it causes your pressure. The pressure causes the cervix to soften, open and dilate to allow the baby to be born. Contractions are really important. So as I just said, 
Here's a little picture of types of contractions. What this picture says is false contractions and true contractions, or what that might mean is latent phase contractions and active labor contractions. So latent phase contractions, they're likely to be short lasting, they're likely to be a little bit irregular, the change with movement. So in the latent phase, you might feel them stronger if you're standing up and if you lie down, they might ease off. When you're in active labor, doesn't matter what position that you're gonna get in, you could be on the ball, on the bed, anywhere. If you're in active labor, you'll continue to feel your contractions. Active labor contractions last from 45 seconds to a minute and a half and we'd like you to have about three to four contractions in 10 minutes. When you're in the latent phase, so when things are building, you could have one, two, three contractions in 10 minutes. They'll be a little bit irregular and some will be stronger than others. So this little slide here can tell you how to tell the difference between these early labor contractions and these active labor contractions. The other thing to mention is Latent phase contractions are uncomfortable, but they should be culpable at home. Whereas labor contractions, that might be when you need to come to the maternity unit for some support, guidance off the midwife, and potentially some more pain relief. So what we're gonna go through now is the stages of labor. Now, if you're watching this and you've never had a baby before, you might not realize that us as midwives actually class labor into three stages. So we break down labor into three stages. So the first stage of labor is from when you're four centimeters dilated and having regular strong contractions. From zero dilatation to four centimeters dilatation and the cervix softening and shorten, that's classed as the latent phase, but it's not classed as active labor. Once you're four centimetres dilated, you're now classed in at the first stage of active labour. During this stage, you might still be able to cope with your contractions at home. And like I've said previously, the longer you labour in your own environment, the more happy hormones you have in your body. And it has been proven to shorten this stage of labour. So if you feel that you're coping at home in this stage, ring the maternity unit you booked at and discuss it through with your midwife. However, once you are four centimeters dilated and regularly contracting, you are classed as active labor and you will come to the birthing center, we'll put you on what we call a partogram and that is when we class you as labor and also if you need more pain relief from the midwives, that's when your pain relief options also increase, but we'll discuss that slightly later. If your labor starts at night, you might be able to sleep through these pains at home and that's absolutely fine. Rest up as much as you can for the day ahead. And if your labor starts during the day, it is really important if you can to stay nice and active as that helps with descent of the baby. So you have your first stage of labor and then that goes into your second stage of labor. So your first stage of labor is from when you're four centimeters dilated to 10 centimeters dilated with regular contractions. Once you get to 10 centimeters dilated, that's what we class as fully dilated and you're now in the second stage, the second phase of labor. This is when you are ready to birth your baby. So this is being fully dilated and when you reach the second stage, the midwife might advise you, depending on your body and depending on how you feel, this will be when we might get you to push and obviously the birth of your baby. This part is really important to listen to your midwife, to communicate with your midwife and your birthing partner. This is when the midwife will talk you through everything every step of the way but this often can take some time, especially for your first baby. And I think some people are often a little bit confused. The pushing process can take anything from half an hour and some days in some labors and delivery it can take up to three hours. And this isn't abnormal. It's just your body has never done this before. If it's your first baby and it takes time for your baby to gradually move down your pelvis and out of the vagina. 
So what I would say is just communicate with your midwife the whole time and do not be frightened as everybody's body is designed for labour and delivery and your partner, your midwife, your birthing partner, everybody is here to support you. The labour itself and the pushing itself as well can take anything from sort of six hours to 12 hours and in some cases up to 18 hours. This might seem like a really long time, but actually for us as midwives, we're tracking your progress every step of the way, keeping an eye on the baby every step of the way, and it is normal that it takes a quite long amount of time. So the second stage of labour, as I've just discussed, then is also includes the delivery of the baby. So like I said, once your cervix is fully dilated, when you get the contractions, you might feel the urge to push or to bear down and it often feels like you really, really need to open your bowels. And we will say to you to go with your body, to go with that feeling, and if you feel like you need to bear down, to bear down. Some people, depending on pain relief or position of the baby, don't feel the urge to push, but that is when the midwife will come in and we will have a feel of your tummy, we'll feel that you're contracting and we can guide you through pushing if needed as well. So do not worry about that. The second stage of labour is hard work. It is hard work to push out your baby, but it is definitely worth it and we will be here and support you every step of the way. You just have to keep going and you have to remember that the, the end goal is definitely worth it. So this slide here just shows the cervical dilatation throughout labour. So as you can see, when you're one centimetre dilated, your cervix is about the size of a Cheerio. When you're four centimetres dilated, Dilated, so what we class as active labour, your cervix is as open and as dilated as about a cracker. And when you get to fully dilated towards the end of that second stage of labour, your cervix is as dilated as a bagel. As you can see from this, this shows that if you were anything less than fully dilated, your baby would not be able to fit through your vagina and you would not be able to push. So this is why you have to go through labour, you have to go through all them cervical changes and all the dilatation process to get to fully dilated where the opening of the cervix is large enough for you to push the baby through. So the third stage of labour that often people might not even know about or fully understand is the delivery of the placenta or the afterbirth. So I'm just going to talk you through that now and use a couple of props as best I can to go through it. So once your baby is delivered, obviously with your consent, we bring the baby up and onto mam's tummy. At this point, we often dry the baby slightly and tuck the baby in to give the baby skin to skin. If this is something that you wouldn't like to have happen, if you don't want the baby placed on your tummy straight away, make sure that you tell the midwife who's looking after yourself. Because if not, most maternity units now do routinely bring the baby up on a mam's tummy for skin to skin. Once the baby is up on mam's tummy, I am sorry about the baby, we have dressed it the best that we can. Once the baby is up on mam's tummy, there is a still attached from the placenta inside mam to the baby and it's attached by the umbilical cord. It's at this point that you have to make a decision regarding your own care, whether you would like an active or physiological delivery of the placenta. Your community midwife should discuss this with you, anything from about 38 weeks. If she hasn't, or if you're not sure what that is, I will talk through it with you now, but please go and research them both, because it's really important you make an informed decision about which stage you go for. An active third stage is when we give you an injection of an oxytocic drug into your leg after the birth of the baby. And this is an artificial hormone that helps speed up the delivery of the placenta and it has been known to reduce your chances of bleeding as well. And then what we do is cut and clamp the cord and the midwife delivers the placenta. A physiological third stage is a completely natural third stage where we don't give you any injection. We often maybe get you to sit upright and the placenta just then comes away when it's ready. The active and the physiological have their pros and cons and you've got to figure out what's right for you. The natural physiological delivery of the placenta can take up to an hour, whereas the active stage 
is often a lot shorter and can take sort of anything from 5 to 15 minutes. Again, please go and read up on this and make an informed decision and the midwife looking after you in labour will discuss this with you as well. So when the baby's lying on your tummy, we'll then cut and clamp the cord and we use a plastic cord clamp and we put that close to the baby's umbilical cord. If you wouldn't like a plastic umbilical cord clamp, there is alternative options, but you would have to provide that with provide that yourself. Once the plastic cord is then in place, we then use a metal clamp, which can look scary, but it absolutely isn't. We then use a metal clamp to put on the other end of the umbilical cord that is still attached to the placenta. Between these two clamps, that is when we then use these umbilical cord scissors to cut the cord and the baby is then separated from the placenta. You have to ask the midwife looking after you and it depends on the unit and the guidelines of if the dad is allowed to cut the umbilical cord. Most places now, I think that the dad is allowed to cut the umbilical cord, but please check with the midwife looking after you and what hospital you booked in. The umbilical cord will then be cut, the baby will then be put up on a mum's chest for skin to skin, and then the delivery of the placenta, that third stage will then take place. Here's just a picture of the placenta and the umbilical cord, and this is it actually completely attached to the baby, which is known as a lotus birth, which is where we do not cut and clamp the cord, and the placenta comes away naturally, and it's attached to the baby still. So there's a little picture of that for you. Now we're gonna go on and talk about pain relief options in labor. So the first pain relief option, we're going to go through is going to be the Entenox, which is also the gas and air. I would like to mention briefly at this point, you can also use heat packs, paracetamol, warm water, and obviously mobilization as pain relief. There is also TENS machine, which some units have and others do provide them if you ring up and inquire. So this is all really good pain relief in latent phase of labor, but I'm going to go through the pain relief in the active phase of labor. So gas and air or Entenox is probably the most common pain relief used throughout labour. It's used through a pipe system in the, uh, in the hospitals, in the maternity units, and it's delivered through a mouthpiece. You breathe it in and breathe it out on the mouth mouthpiece. It takes 15 seconds to get into your system, so the midwife will guide you through when to use it doesn't have a lot of side effects, but it can make you feel slightly woozy and slightly lightheaded. It doesn't have any side effects on the baby. I do have here one of the mouthpieces that we often tend to use. So this will be attached to tubing and we'll ask you to place your mouth over the mouthpiece, breathe in and out on the mouthpiece. And normally it helps you regulate your breathing, slow your breathing, and it gives you pain relief through your full contractions. The next pain relief option that is becoming more and more popular, and especially here at the birthing center, we absolutely love is a water birth. I'm not gonna go over water birth in a lot of detail as our next class is actually all about water birth giving birth in the water and how wonderful it is. So please, if you're interested in this, please watch my next session. The next pain relief option available, if you're going up the chain of pain relief, is diamorphine. Diamorphine is an opiate-based injection that lasts from two to four hours and it's given in your upper thigh. We we'll often give diamorphine with an anti-sickness at the same time because it has been proven to make some women feel a bit sick, can make you feel lightheaded, can make you feel woozy and tired. Diamorphine is a good painkiller when you're in labour and can often take the contractions back to feeling like labour late in phase pains or can make you less aware of the pain. However, this can be side effects to the baby, it can make the baby slightly sleepy, can affect the baby's feeding after delivery, and in some cases, the midwife might not recommend diamorphine if it's given too close to the birth of the baby for these reasons. The next pain relief option is an epidural. Often women think that epidurals are quite common, but actually they're becoming less and less common in days, today's society because of the more that we know about the importance of being upright and mobile in labor. An epidural, as I've said, is a fantastic painkiller. And obviously it is done by an anesthetist. 
So therefore it is more of a high risk procedure and does come with complications. One in a hundred women can suffer a bad headache after an epidural. Due to the location of the epidural, you can suffer from a bad back. An epidural often numbs you or creates numbness from the waist down and this can often slow labour down and in particular the second stage of labour. Often women who have had an epidural sometimes do have secondary complications and may need things like catheter and extra monitoring of the baby's heart rate. However, like said, if you feel you need an epidural, it is a fantastic painkiller. Now we've discussed the stages of labour and pain relief, it's really important to discuss monitoring of the baby. This is the midwife's role throughout your labour. In the first stages of labour, she will have to monitor the baby's heart rate every 15 minutes. And in the active second stage of labour, it can be as often as every five minutes or sometimes more. If you're also a high risk pregnancy, you might be put on what we call a CTG monitor, which monitors your baby's heart rate continuously and prints it out on a piece of paper so we can observe the baby the whole time. This is probably one of the most important parts of your labour. I have here a pinard and a Doppler, which are the two most routine instruments we use to listen to the baby's heart rate, just so you're aware what they look like. So this is a pinard stethoscope that the midwife will pop out ear to and listen to your baby's heart rate through your tummy. This should be routinely used, sometimes often used to just differentiate between an electric monitor and obviously listening with your ear. A handheld Doppler, which is this one, you might have seen when you go to a community midwife appointment, which the midwife will place on your abdomen and listen to the baby's heart rate. These are probably most commonly used. But as we say, no matter what position you're in, no matter where you are or how uncomfortable you might be, it's really important that the midwife assesses your baby's heart rate as this is our only indication of your baby's well-being throughout labour. So now we're going to talk about assisted deliveries. This is a Vontus or vacuum extraction delivery or a forceps delivery. These types of deliveries are performed in obstetric units and performed by obstetricians. These deliveries can take place when you are fully dilated and they can take place for several reasons but normally due to maternal or fetal problems throughout labour and delivery. This is when the vacuum extraction or the forceps or the Vontus cup or the forceps themselves are placed onto the baby's head and the mam will push and the obstetrician will pull and help to deliver the baby. This speeds up the second stage of delivery and gets the baby here in a shorter amount of time. Often with these types of delivery to allow room to apply the instruments or to allow room to speed up delivery, it's recommended and will be discussed with you that you also have an episiotomy which is a cut down towards the down in the vagina to like we say increase the outlet of the vagina the next type of delivery is a cesarean section cesarean section rates in the uk are going down and they are on the downfall however it is still an option when you are having your baby that you might end up with a cesarean section due to fetal reasons if we were worried about the baby sometimes if the baby's in the breech position if you've had previous sections or if it's recommended by your doctor for some particular reason a cesarean section they make a small 10 centimeter cut down to where your bikini line is in theatre normally done on a spinal anaesthetic or if they were particularly worried it could be done on a general anaesthetic and they bring the baby up out of the abdomen. A caesarean section does take more time to recover from than normal delivery and obviously it is a major abdominal operation and does come with complications and risks but these will be discussed with you at the time and it is only ever recommended when all the team looking after you feel is the safest option for you and your baby. The next thing I'm going to talk about is induction of labour. Induction of labour you might be offered for several reasons. The most common reason is that you're overdue your dates or your post dates and that is when you hit 41 weeks gestation 
we might offer you induction. It is an option, so it can be declined as there are pros and cons for induction and for waiting longer. Or induction might be recommended due to other things. For example, if we're worried about yourself or worried about the baby. Induction of labour is where we try to spur on and speed up labour. Induction is where you go into the maternity unit and you often have vaginal examinations and pessary like tablets inserted into the vagina that work and release prostaglandin hormones over six hours, which is artificial hormones that are designed to shorten, soften and dilate your cervix and often designed to stimulate contractions. Every unit has slightly different guidelines for induction. So what I would say is if you're going to be induced, ask your community midwife, ask for a leaflet about induction or ring your local maternity unit to find out their induction's guidelines. So the next thing I'm going to go through is if you do choose to come here and have your baby at the birthing centre, Obviously, as women do know and is discussed, there is the possibility of transfer to Sunderland. As previously discussed, if you wanted an epidural throughout your labour, we don't offer that here at the birthing centre. So if you did want that, we would transfer you to the obstetric unit at Sunderland for an epidural. That would be via an ambulance transfer and the midwife and your partner will go in the ambulance with you and be with you the whole time. There is obviously some other reasons as well. You may need to be transferred to the obstetric unit if we thought your labour was going from a low risk labour to a high risk labour. And these reasons are discussed on the slide provided. We do have a low transfer rate, but we do have to tell you about these, this information as well. If you have any questions about this presentation, please ring either the birthing centre or the unit that you are booked at or your community midwife. I know it's been a long presentation, so thank you so much for watching and please don't hesitate to contact any of us at all. If you would like more information on the birthing centre, please give us a ring as we're more than happy to discuss things with you and hopefully at some point we will be arranging tours again. Thank you very much for watching and please stick in and watch the next class which is all about water birth and active birth.